Well, you know, you uh, you spend several years in Houston training, and you you practice zero gravity in airplanes. And I'm a fighter pilot, so I'm I was accustomed to many G forces and negative G forces and zero G, uh, but only for 20, 30, 40 seconds at the most in airplanes. So. So it wasn't as easy, or it was much easier for me to transition to weightlessness than somebody perhaps who'd never flown much in particularly fighter tactics. So I didn't experience anything that I wasn't really taught about or or expecting. One of the biggest things, obviously, that happens to you when in the, when you get into weightlessness is you lose all sense of balance. You have no gravity vector working on your inner ear to give you balance that we have here on Earth. When you get in, obviously, in space, there's no gravity vector. So your balance system, sonic, it cages, I call it. It just goes into inoperation, and it doesn't become functional again until you're back on Earth. So the whole time you're in space, you have no balance. Uh, you stop thinking in terms of up and down and uh, down there and up there. It's just you kind of uh, orient yourself with relationship to your spacecraft, so to speak. If you're in the cabin, you're looking at the the wall in the mid deck and if the writing's upside down you know your head's toward the floor and those kind of things so uh everybody gets loses all sense of balance another couple of things that happen to your body that people might not recognize i got i got an inch and a half taller in space because of the gravity gravity once again is not working on my spinal column and my other joints to pull me toward earth so when i get into space each one of these little joints separates maybe an eighth of an inch and cumulatively, I grew to be an inch and a half taller in space. And you lose a proportional amount of your body weight because when you get into orbit, you don't need all the body fluid that you that you need to live and work here in gravity that's kind of drawn toward the bottom part of your body into your abdomen and legs by gravity. When you get into weightlessness, all this fluid redistributes itself about your body, and consequently, uh, the sensory systems say, hey, you've got too much body fluid, John, so you spend about two days going to the bathroom a whole lot and drinking very little fluid until the body senses, okay, I'm okay now. I'm in balance. So then you start drinking normally after a couple of days in orbit and to maintain a, a body fluid level that's consistent with what you need to be in weightlessness. And as soon as you head back toward Earth, we anticipate the, the need for this fluid to replace it. So we try to drink a couple of quarts of liquid before we even, after we've done our deorbit burn and are, are for sure headed back to Earth, we'll try to force liquid into our body because when you get back to Earth, you're insatiably thirsty for at least the first two days as you replenish uh, all this fluid. I lost about a gallon during the first, that's, it equates to about eight pounds, uh, four, kilo, four kilos or something like that of body fluid. And the heart gets larger because it's still working with the same intensity in space, but it doesn't have to overcome as much resistance. So most people's hearts uh, enlarge uh, maybe 50% larger in space than they are on Earth. So there's some body transformations that you go through. And generally, for short missions anyway, it's all recoverable when you get back to Earth. I uh, Generally, the five senses are... As far as I was concerned, you, you, your taste buds are a little bit different in space. You can really enjoy something on Earth and order it and taste it and practice eating it on Earth, and then when you get the same thing in space, it tastes a little bit different. Uh, I wouldn't say extremely different, but the taste buds are just, they don't function exactly the same way they do in space. Uh, Odors, I think, are generally the same. I don't, I don't recall any difference in things that smell in space that are, don't smell the same way on Earth. Uh, eyes and vision are the same, except you're a little bit confused with your balance system, as I mentioned. Uh, we have, we've learned on our uh, long-duration space flight missions of six months or so that we're, we're, we're uh, detect detecting some uh, uh, retina problems, minor, some, some a little bit more than minor retina problems uh, in the eyesight with people who spent many, many months up there. So we're a little bit concerned about that right now as far as long-duration missions. Hearing is about the same. I don't remember any differences in that. And then feeling is, uh, doesn't change much between Earth and space. Well, it's different. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the first couple of nights, I did not. Uh, my adrenaline was so strong and my excitement was so elevated that the last thing I seemed to want to do was sleep and waste all this precious time that I had worked toward uh, sleeping. So I think for the first couple of nights, I've we go around the Earth every hour and a half. I, most, we, I hope people know that. We 
travel 24,000 miles around the equator in an hour and a half, and as we go around the Earth each time, we do see a sunset and a sunrise because we go behind the Earth into darkness for 45 minutes, and then we have a sunrise and between the sun and the Earth for 45 minutes and so on. So we see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24 hours. And obviously they're exciting because the sun comes up and goes down in about 15 seconds. But uh, it would be very irritating during an eight-hour sleep cycle if you had to live through five so sunrises and sunsets. So we put blinds over all of our windows to darken the cabin so that it doesn't interrupt your sleep. But I found myself during the first couple of nights of eight-hour sleeping cycles peeking out, the, pulling back the blinds and peeking out the corner of the window many, many hours just to see <laughs> how the beauty of this earth uh, you know, I, I think it was about the third night when I was really tired, having done, you know, essentially two straight days of work and not much sleep. And about the third night when control center says, okay, boys and girls, it's time to sleep, I think I fell asleep in about 16 nanoseconds and uh, slept very well. I, the uh, rest of the flight, every night when it was time to sleep, I found myself uh, kind of falling off right away and really didn't wake much until the next morning when the alarm went off. Sleeping is kind of an individual thing. You can pretty much sleep anywhere you want to, and sleeping bags that we have for you to zip up and with a tether to tie to the ceiling or the floor or the wall, whichever way you want your feet to be pointed. And I, I found the, a lot of people like to sleep in their flight deck chairs up on the flight deck and strap themselves with their seat belt to keep them from floating away. Uh, my, my preference was to sleep in the airlock tucked in between the two pressure suits, and it kept me from floating, and it was cooler and quieter in there, and uh, just I, I found, and I kind of fit perfectly in between those pressure suits, so it was a, it was my place to sleep. I have heard all kinds of different differing stories about dreams in space. I personally don't do a lot of dreaming on Earth. I don't recall doing a lot of dreaming in space. I, I I've heard people say that yeah, it enhanced their dreams, and I've heard other people say that it stopped their dreams. So I don't think there's any consensus on uh, how spaceflight affects the dreaming component. I believe that to be true, and we, one of my favorite wake-up calls though was uh, Country Roads. You remember John Denver and C Take Me Home, Country Roads? That was about West Virginia, my home state. So they they played that for me one morning.